you know, it's been so normalized. We don't think about it, but human beings have individual rights. We also know that corporations have been granted those rights. Uh, they're legally considered persons under the law. But we don't think about ecosystems having their own rights, uh, like lakes, rivers, mountains, etc. Uh, we don't extend it to them. I think we mentioned this before, but but expressing that concept to most people just seems like such a foreign concept, and it's so strange. Why would you think of a river as a living being? But this is an idea that's been around far longer mm. than so-called rights under Western liberal democracy frameworks. Mm -hmm. These are actually the perspectives of indigenous peoples the world over. And I also think that what I saw in the film, you're just really taking this indigenous perspective and implementing and incorporating it into the legal framework and granting rights to these things that we may not, in our way of thinking, traditionally understand to be alive, like a river, like a lake, or the atmosphere, the oceans, or whatever it may be. Um, how did each of you come across this rights of nature movement? And if you could talk about, once you were both introduced to this idea... Um, what have you come to understand it to be? I could ask uh, Josh first if you could answer that, and we can go uh, from there. Uh, mine goes back to like you know, basically like an existential crisis in college, um, dealing with watching a documentary like uh, the Corporation, which I think was released in two thousand five, and then reading books like, um, you know. Uh, story of B or Ishmael, you know, where they're talking about what's, what's the next big vision of society, you know, what's going to take us out of this agricultural system into a new system. I remember just grappling with those concepts in school and being really unfulfilled when trying to have conversations about it in the classroom. And then going back and thinking about human rights as this next wave of thinking that revolutionized our society. And then, you know, I'm trying to like process that, like what's going to be the wave after human rights and what seemed to happen for me organically. Uh, and then also happening in the real world in Pennsylvania was that it was clear that rights of nature could be the next evolution of our society when it came to confronting agriculture and confronting colonialism and everything else um, that we have. So I really came to it, you know, through this, um, you know, experience in, in school, just trying to understand what to do, you know, in the future with our work. And I wrote a business plan for a company in Ohio that was based on these um, rights of nature principles where we were overthrowing the food system there and creating a local food system that was implementing, um, you know, kind of rights of nature ideas. And that was like 2007 and eight that we were rolling that out. And, you know, I gave some speeches about rights of nature in Bowling Green State University around like 2010 or 11. And you may as well have been talking about aliens. <laughs> People are just looking at you like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> I'm like, well, I think we could give nature rights. That's what I'm talking about. And professors are like, what the fuck is he saying? You know, and they're like, and it was hard to talk about it back then. You had very little to stand on. And, uh, you know, so when Melissa and I got confronted with rights of nature being, um, a, a part of the resistance for the fracking movement. We were like, holy shit, like this, <laughs> we can finally talk about this concept and people will, will be willing to like, you know, have a discussion about it. Um, and I, and, you know, and back to your thoughts about capitalism, you know, and, and Milton Friedman and indigenous cultures and Western cultures. I think that Western cultures um, may never have reached a point of rights of nature without capitalism. For me, capitalism is like um, this thing that's created a defense mechanism unknowingly. It's, it's the Achilles heel of capitalism, which is rights of nature. Um, so I feel like, you know, that's kind of uh, an evolution beyond 
capitalism that will replace it someday unless we just move straight into fascism. So, yeah. And Melissa, how about you? Well, um, I think I've, you know, like Josh, I've always had this background, this sore discomfort um, over the, the way things are and never quite been satisfied with the solutions or answers that I've come across. And that carried through um, when after I became an environmental journalist and started covering water contamination. So I guess more recently I came through, I came to Rights of Nature Through Water in documenting the water contamination from the fracking development across Pennsylvania, where I'm from, and the systemic cover-up of that of that harm by both states and corporations. And like Josh said, um, after the screenings of our first film, Triple Divide, which was a documentary about that cover-up, that systemic collusion to cover up the, the water contamination and poisoning of people, um, people we know who've died, um, and many, many more. At the end of those screenings, people, you know, well, if the system's so fucked, then what do we do? And for a while, there was a lot of discussion about removing personhood from corporations, and I'm, I'm not opposed to that, but I I do also acknowledge that removing corporate personhood does not stop corporate harm. And then one day I heard about this community, Grant Township in Western Pennsylvania, who had passed a local law asserting their community rights to establish rights for nature. And it was that mechanism through it was through that mechanism that they banned the injection of radioactive waste in their community. This is a very rural, uh, predominantly, if not all white, um, Republican municipality in Pennsylvania, and um, they they democratically voted to become a home rule municipality, pass a local bill of rights, and then a home rule charter to, to ban this activity. Um, and when I heard about that, and then I found out, oh, there's this whole org- there's this whole movement, the rights of nature movement to establish legal rights for nature. Those rights being that this, that the living entity that nature is, has the right to exist flourish and naturally evolve. And, you know, alarm bells, that's when the alarm bells went off in my head. And that, I mean, that is really what I had been waiting for, you know, for, for a long time. Okay. That is something that makes sense to me that doesn't feel like I'm playing a game of whack-a-mole and you know what I mean? It could, because it gets to the fundamental problem which is that in the Western system of law, nature is not a living thing. Nature is property. And private property, which nature is in our law, is the pillar of capitalism. So this one, this one um, strategy gets to the very core of the problem, it seems to me. Um, and so obviously it needed to have, it needed, we needed to make a film about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, you put a lot of love into this, I can tell. And, and it's something you said about this community in Pennsylvania that was working to stop this injection site. Is mm-hmm. that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, deep well so, injection site. Well injection, yeah. Yeah, could you explain what that is, what an injection well site is? An injection well is where toxic waste is injected 
underground for for disposal. And the pro there are many problems with this, um, ranging from size. Uh, it induces seismic events, earthquakes. Um, it migrates from the so-called storage area it's being ejected to, which is really just a geologic formation. Um, it's not like they're like digging down, making a big steel tank, and, and then injecting into it. They're just injecting into the into deep formations under the uh, engineered assumption that it's going to stay put <laughs> because nothing underground not ever moves, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah. but obviously, I mean, it uh, it it does move. It migrates, and it you know, in Grant Township, where injection was banned through, uh, through their local charter that granted rights to nature and established their, their community and didn't establish their community rights and forced their community rights um, to, for consent. Um, community rights goes hand in hand with rights of nature, and it's really about consent. Um, but they, they, they're very rural. Their water, they only get their water from groundwater. They are too far away from any public water system to to hook up should the inje an injection well contaminate their aquifer. And they also are very proud of the land, and they love the land where they live. They're very um, cognizant of the quality of the waters that feed the land and the unique species that live there only there in a lot, um, like the hellbender, the hellbender salamander, which is a prehistoric creature that is, is, is finds very few places to live because it needs exceptionally pristine and very cold water. And, um, when the company came to their community to put in this waste injection well, they at first tried to bargain. They went to, they went up the hierarchy of the ladder of power, so to speak, to their, to their state and federal regulatory agencies and thought for sure, once they see how terrible this is for, for our for our home and the homes of the creatures who live here, they will deny it. Of course they did not. And through that process, that kind of like wait, that process of waking up to the reality that the system of law, that our environmental protection agencies are not actually there to protect us. They are there to permit harm and legalize that harm. They, said, okay, well, then we're just going to say no. And that's what they did. Well, I think you said this, Melissa. Um, this is a white Republican, fairly conservative town. And and you don't think of these places, of these people that fit in that demographic of being or having an environmentally sound battle to protect the local environment. And I think that actually points to something really important fundamentally true which is that regardless of political affiliation is that um is that your actual immediate environment is being affected it doesn't seem like it matters whether you're a supposedly trump or biden supporter or conservative or liberal it seems like it cuts through all of those dichotomies those um those polarizations that we seem to experience in the united states right now it seems to cut through that ones that affects you and your family in your area. Um, Josh, in your experience of filming this, did, did that, does that come up? Political affiliation and recognizing that actually, that the system itself is actually meant to benefit corporations in that process. And for people that are politically aligned on the right, I mean, how do they deal with that when that issue comes yeah, up for um, them? Yeah, I definitely want to jump on that. I got to remember, though, speaking of our whiteness, um, I forgot to do <laughs> the land recognition mm -hmm. um, about where I'm at. I'm in so-called, you know, occupied Pittsburgh here, which used to be um, the land of the Osage. 
um, Susquehanna and the Haudenosaunee. Um, and in this place, you know, it's now occupied, as you said, uh, by a lot of right wing uh, white people. And many of them were in Grant Township and they did vote for a bill that has rights of nature included in it. And yes, uh, that completely destroys most of your beliefs if you're listening to this right now. <laughs> because <laughs> the shit just doesn't sound real. Um, and th- that boils down to, you know, the framing of these issues um, and who's doing the framing. You know, the, the, the discussion about the right to clean water uh, works in rural areas because most of them in Pennsylvania unlike many other parts in the country are on their own water supplies. So they understand what it means to have clean water, free water, um, and to have that water be jeopardized. So for anybody to come in and threaten that availability of clean water to them, they will fight that. And they have fought that. And many of them are our sources at public Herald, uh, and they've influenced our work to date. And we wouldn't have done any of the work we've done to date uh, without many of the um, conservative Republicans sharing uh, their stories with us uh, about their concerns for the environment. Um, so, you know, this this common mistake of excluding the conservative community um, from the environmental discussions is uh, something people have to reflect on and remember pretty often because uh, it's not true. Um, there is an opportunity to talk with the conservative community about the environment. Um, But it sure as hell isn't going to be an opportunity with, in regards to regulation. So don't be going in there trying to talk to them about increasing (laughs) regulations uh, because they're going to turn their back on you and shut the door. And I don't blame them. Um, You know, maybe I would have said that was okay to talk about regulations in college because I was being uh, somewhat brainwashed by, you know, classes. But immediately after I got out, it became really clear that these regulatory agencies are total failures. Um, the, you know, the most important laws in, in the country were passed by a conservative president. Richard Nixon is responsible for all of our environmental laws that mean anything to date. And even with that, we're still polluting rivers and creeks and everything else so bad that here in the city of Pittsburgh, I can't walk out my door and take my dog to a creek or a river without being worried about her being poisoned by pollution somewhere, which is fucking crazy. You know, I mean, that's, I mean, there's creeks and rivers all over this city and I can't go to one without worrying about pollution. And that is a result of our um, regulatory systems. And I think the conservative communities understand that. I mean, they're not fucking blind. They're seeing what's going on and why would they have any faith in it? Fracking has just destroyed that public trust to the point where it's never going to be recovered ever you're going to have to have an entirely new system of dealing with environmental safety and that's what grand township is doing they're doing that new system which is that listen the state is totally fucking us they want to point they want to pump poisons into our ground underneath our feet and, and potentially ruin our water supply so we're going to make our own decisions and many of the communities in the country have the opportunity to do that they have a system set in place called home rule, which they can utilize. And if they pass home rule legislation, like Grant did, they can start to take away the state's responsibilities for their community. And then they become the decision makers of that community, which is what Grant did. And I don't know any right wing community in the country who wouldn't say they want less of the state and federal government in their backyards. So I think that's what it boils down to um, with why a a place like this would welcome such a a radically um, and, you know, driven environmental concept. 